Hello and welcome to episode 108 of our SAP on Azure video podcast. Today is September 1st, and together with Robert and Goran, we are here to talk about anything related to SAP and Microsoft. Hello, everyone. Hi. So Hi. when I started at Microsoft um, about five years ago, um, and I had my first customer engagements um, about running SAP on Azure, there was a lot of concerns by customers on how secure it actually was. After all, running your most critical SAP business applications somewhere else is a big step. Um, and having a server under your desk always feels much, much sa safer than, than running it in the cloud. In the meantime, I have to say that when I have discussions with customers, these discussions have completely changed. Customers are moving their SAP system to Azure because of the enhanced security and protection that Azure provides. In current times with data breaches, hackers, ransomware, this has become even more important. So today, so today um, we want to kick off a new, uh, a few sessions actually, um, that focus on security. And I'm very happy to have Paul Edlund joining us. He will start talking about the physical security in our data centers today, and we'll, we'll have a few more sessions with him later on. But before we hand over to him, um, let's quickly take a look at some of the news from this week. And I actually want to start with um, an old timer in our in our podcast, and Martin Pankratz. He has released a new um, blog post. I would say a blog post entry page, basically, where he talks about um, yeah middleware integrations. So obviously, a lot of customers are still using um, PIPO, so process integration, process orchestration um, from SAP, and um now obviously there, there are there are new ways how to do this so so basically here it's, it's time to clean up your dusty leg legacy integration flows and go to a new area and um what he's talking about he's um he has a full list already of um potential scenarios that he will cover in the future i mean um, right now the starting point is a blog post from bartosh um, about um, the IDOX integrations there, but um, th there's, as you can see, there's a long list of other topics. Um, he, he also immediately stated, look, th there are multiple ways how you can do this. So there's definitely a way to do this with PIPO. And um, remember that there's also some documentations on how to run PIPO in Azure, but then there's SAP integration suite on BTP. And there's obviously Azure integration services that you can use to do the, to do these kinds of integrations. So um, I'm really looking forward um, on the evolution of this blog post and also then on these different um, upcoming blogs uh, from, from him. And moving on, um, looking at um, some some new docs articles on on Microsoft and um, on our documentation page, there's now an, a new entry for inbound and outbound internet connections for SAP on Azure. So obviously you run your SAP system on Azure and then it's all about connectivity. How do you allow an SAP router to connect to, to the internet? Um, how do you enable an SAP Fiori launchpad to be accessed from outside? How do you connect this to your on-premises environment? And in this docs article, there, there are a lot of different architectures that outline um, how to set up um, yeah, the, the network design, how to um, set up the, the different um, um, components of a typical SAP system so that the connectivity is possible. So it's, it's, it's a really um, great article that, that really talks about a lot of different services and how to place them um, in Azure so that you can have a secure inbound and outbound um, connection. The next one, Goran, um, is something that you brought up. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this new. one, yeah, we, we were talking about, um, we, we had in the previous, one of the previous, uh, this topic, it's about the simplified um, mount structure for a uh, highly, highly available SAP system on Linux. Uh, it was, the work is done by Ralitza. I was showing basically the, the documentation, but she wrote a very nice blog. So I, definitely we should, we should list it. She goes on a high level, what's basically being done and what, what did they do and how the collaboration with Slice was in exactly here explaining what's all about. Again, very short, the main point is cluster is not mounting here anymore. Uh, file structure, but has some magic just to bring it online um, or amount uh, and uh, when it fail over here or there. So nice blog as an overview, and then basically we we had already a link to the deep dive documentation. Uh, yeah. 
Um, if you will go to the next one, it is also done by Alitza, really um, an interesting story. If you scroll a bit down uh, to some picture, basically it's about uh, initially, we um, ability to install application servers on the central services cluster. Mm -hmm. So in the past, we were not allowing this, right? Um, for different reasons. However, there is always a push to optimize the load and customers were telling why should I use the CPU and RAM on the central services cluster uh, mm -hmm. and install additional, I mean, application server also on those nodes. So, this is the first document. It's on Red Hat. Um, actually, it's interesting that uh, it's being telling that uh, both application servers are clustered as well. Mm -hmm. So together with central services and together with NQ replication. So you have basically four clustered instances, right? But one should run on one node, another on another one. So definitely that is something that will help customer to uh, optimize the cost and consolidate basically to load um, if they want to do it. Currently, it's on Red Hat, but let's see if we would get it on, on another operating systems. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. Then, then we'll go a little higher up the stack. So, so not about the um, how to install a service, but then what can you do with this? And um, the Microsoft Cloud Workshop team, um, they have created a, a new entry for um, SAP with data and AI. Um, so these are these are these um, Microsoft Cloud workshops um, that cover a broad range of, of different scenarios. And in this one here, we have the hand on hands on lab for um, data and AI. And if you if you actually go here in the hands on lab, it really outlines you step by step um, how you can run such a workshop um, with your your customers, with your teams. Um, it's uh, let me see here here. So it's this scenario that we talked about already in, in the past where you have an s system, where you have a Cosmos database, where you use Synapse um, to combine the data, where we're using Azure machine learning to then predict some information or some, some, some results obviously on this combined data. And then we have a Power BI dashboard to visualize the data and we're using Power Automate to actually take actions on the data. So, so typically you see something in Power BI and now you want to um, yeah, take actions on, on what you just saw. And, and that's uh, where we also now have um, Power Automate to do this integration. So I think this is a really, really cool hands-on um, lab. Um, we actually, Martin and I and a few others, we did this already um, with um, with customers. So it's, I think it resonates extremely well. And now we have here really all the documentation, what you need to do, how you need to prepare your environment and then um, what your participants need to um, do to, to actually get these scenarios up and running. Then, um, I mean, Robert is not here, but um, he does have a presentation at the European Cloud Summit. So if you are um, in Frankfurt at the time of um, September 26 and 28, um, then you should definitely register here. And Robert has a session, let me quickly, Look him up um, on best practices um, for designing re reliability in Azure. So um, if you, I mean, obviously you have seen Robert here on the podcast. If you want to see him live, then um, join the European Cloud Summit and uh, uh, watch his session on um, reliability in Azure. Then one last thing, um, the All Things SAP on Azure podcast, they are now on episode four and they have colleagues from the Azure NetApp team or the NetApp um, team um, joining them and they talk about Azure NetApp files with SAP. So uh, this is actually a really nice um, uh, discussion again from um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the team around the All Things SAP on Azure. So if you want to learn more about um, Azure NetApp files, um, you should definitely check this out. And actually, we also had a session with Reat um, from, from NetApp on, on Azure NetApp files as well. But if you want to hear more, then also take a look at this one. Good, that was all for, for this week. Um, and now I'm, I'm really looking forward um, to uh, listening to Paul. Paul, you have created a nice um, whiteboard that you will guide us through. But before you do that, maybe you can quickly introduce yourself, what you're doing at Microsoft, and then yeah, let, let's take a look at what you have prepared. 
Well, first of all, I want to say it, I'm grateful to be on episode 108, and congratulations on getting past 100. That's pretty cool. Uh, thank you. It's a, it's a lot of late nights editing video, I assume, Holger. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, um, but it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it is. I, I'm sure. So, yeah, I'm, I'm Paul. I work out of a group of our facilities in micro, inside of Microsoft called the Microsoft Technology Centers. And so there are, I think, 44 of these around the globe. I work out of the one in Chicago. And so when Holger and Goran and folks look me up internally, I'm listed as something called a principal architect. Um, to the outside world for the last eight years, I've carried a different business card, and I'll explain why. It's, uh, but I, it started as a, it started uh, with a different reason in mind. So I, my business card actually says chief technologist for the Central Region. About three reorgs ago, um, they didn't have anybody to shove into some of these positions, and so they threw me in there. Uh, and, and I'll just give you a, some ideas around this because initially nobody got paid in any of these places. And so they needed somebody to cover conversations where nobody got paid. Um, so eight years ago, nobody really focused on the chief information security officer um, regionally. So what they did is they initially made me the CISO pair. Um, so in that world and today it's still, I, I still stay there. Uh, back then we didn't have the 8,500 security individuals that we have now. Um, and that number has grown substantially over, even over the last few months. It's, we used to say 5,000, and now it's up to 8,500. It's because of some of the things that we're doing. Um, but so in those discussions, I have conversations about what we do internally at Microsoft around cybersecurity, as well as what we advocate the customers do, plus all the products that we make in security. So um, I do a lot of talking about that. The second part of my brain focuses on our research and development, also a place that nobody gets paid. So, uh, you know, in that world, I'm not talking about products at all. So I'm discussing things like our thoughts on quantum computers and where we're going with topological qubits and what that means. Um, I talk about new ways that we're storing data, like holographically in quartz or inside a programmable DNA. Um, talking about the ways that we emulate your brain in cognition and cognitive services. Um, okay. Discussing things like how we <laughs> communicate with plants, uh, and that's actually a thing. It's called Project Florence and the way we use, uh, how we're using uh, chemical reactions and plants to communicate with uh, people. <laughs> Why would uh, you do that? Well, as a part of our biodiversity efforts, for example, you know, what we need to be able to do is have a, so the idea behind Project Florence is that I might uh, talk to a forest and say, how is everybody feeling today? And the oak trees would respond chemically with uh, a, a, a way to respond in a way that wow. they can tell me versus a pine tree, which might respond differently from a bush that would respond or a daisy in a field. Each of them has a different chemical makeup. But today we don't really have a means of understanding. Like if I ask a, a, a question in English or German and just says, how are you today? We mm -hmm. need to be able to get a response back in a way that understands them. So what really, really building a language of is chemical reactions in plants so that when I say to a daisy, how are you doing? It can respond back to me. And if I if I change the environment, it can chemically tell me what it's what it's responding as opposed to today where we'd have to figure it out through like pH or humidity or, you know, light, et cetera. You know, we have to understand the difference between a way a daisy would communicate versus a rose, for example, or an oak tree versus a pine tree. So, anyways, we, we didn't expect this, Paul. So, you know, <laughs> yes. I'm chock full of craziness. <laughs> and then, lastly, I focus on our data center strategies, which is the reason why I'm here. I actually give tours of our data centers, once again, a place that nobody gets paid. So I give tours of the facility in Chicago, but I've also been, you know, I've I've been around the globe and looked at other facilities as well. So um, I talk a lot about what we do physically. And the reason why I do this, honestly, is because our data centers look and feel nothing like what customers are used to. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they you tend to have an expectation for what a data center is. It's like, oh, it's a raised floor with rows of servers and freezing cold rooms. And then they step into ours and they're extremely hot. We don't use air conditioning anymore. There's no more air conditioning. We don't, we put fires out with water in some cases. It's like, well, that's electrical equipment. You know, we put servers at the bottom of the ocean. We put them in shipping containers outside. We don't do raid on hard drives. It's like just stuff that normal data center operations would be like, what are you doing? So I have to describe the how and the why and the what. That's so. Ahead, and I just want to echo that. So I was lucky enough to to visit both the data centers in um, Europe West, so in Amsterdam, and also then in in Europe North in, in in Dublin. And the first time I went there with a with a fairly big customer, so they had their own data centers, not only one. They had multiple um, places where they had 
And when they entered our region, they were just blown away because it was completely different to what they had. Um, and, and again, they, this, this was not a small customer. This was yeah. a bigger customer. They had their own data centers, but still it was completely different scale. Yeah, for sure. And it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't look the way they expect them to. So it's, you really have to, you know, even when I walk through our data centers, I, I have to ask people, what is that? What is that doing? Because it doesn't, it doesn't look or feel like a traditional data center. They, they mm -hmm. do nothing like them. So it really makes you re kind of interpret what you think a data center is in many ways. And I mean, now, for example, and I, I'm not going to go through them all, but we're putting servers in liquid and running them inside a liquid in, in, in some of our data centers, like in Quincy, Washington. Uh, you know, dual immersion, what we call dual immersion uh, cooling. It's it just like, you know, it, that makes people's heads pop off. Why Why would you be running servers in liquid? Well, it's because we're getting out of the air conditioning game, you know? Mm -hmm. So anyways, um, you know, cool. when you're putting this together, Holger and I, we, we thought it might be fun just to talk about some of the physical security controls. And then after that, we might, we'll start building this like a house. And so hopefully this will be fun for everybody. There's no marketing today. It's all like, how does it work? Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So you want me to just jump right in here, Olga? Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's go cool. ahead. Yeah. So I I'm going to share uh, a whiteboard with you all. By the way, I created this mostly because I wasn't a big fa uh, fan of some of the slides that we had. And I didn't think it, uh, for the purposes of this conversation, I didn't feel like it worked. So at, you know, six o'clock last night or whatever, I started building this this whiteboard out so that I could talk to you guys today. Actually, I started a few days ago, but I finished it yesterday. So um, are you seeing this, Holger, now? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay, Perfect. cool. Yeah, so I'm going to go a few different places, and you know I love it, Gorn and, and Olga. If you guys stop me if you have questions, um, you know. But I want to talk through some of the physical security controls that we that we employ in our facilities, and then um, and then uh, we'll just have a discussion. Okay, yep, so perfect. What if, let's start with you know the very first topic that I thought would be useful to start with is you know that this idea of regions, and I'm not going to talk about regions in the way that you may think I am. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about the physic some of the physical things that lead us to security. Okay. So um when so let me just kind of unpack what a region is really quickly. So when you when we say regions, regions are not data centers. Regions mm -hmm. consist of multiple data centers. Now where I live in Chicago, this is the what we call the North Central US region. Um before COVID, I the the number was something like seven data centers in the region. Um, I, I don't know the exact number right now because we have a tool internally that we use to, uh, you know, kind of tell me all of the the addresses and places where they are. Um, and so I used to just count, you know. Uh, it, it keeps increasing. As a matter of fact, I know that we just bought like, you know, a massive plot of land north of O'Hare Airport in Chicago that we're expanding into right now too. So like, it's somewhere probably 10, 12, I don't know, something like that in the region. I don't know. But anyways, when you get into regions, um, you know, there is no guarantee that your data is in any of the buildings. It's going to be in one of them, mm -hmm. but you can't control which building it's in. And if you think about that technically, what that means is that um, it's almost like for anybody who's familiar with VMware, there's a concept of something called vMotion, which just allows me to move a VM from a physical host to another physical host. When we do Azure, think of vMotion at hyperscale, or what we used, you know, uh, live migration in Hyper-V. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, it's just, we can move things around, but we can move them around between buildings too. Now, because of that, and this is where it starts to get a little geeky, um, you know, the speed of light is going 186,000 miles per second. I don't know what that is in kilometers, by the way. So, but 300,000 like, kilometers per second. Okay. Yeah. If, you, if you say so. Um, <laughs> but like, uh, so for, you know, in miles, though, it's 186,000 miles per second. At that speed, um, what it means is in order for us to support some technologies like re uh, zone redundancy at storage or uh, availability zones in Azure, um, all of those data centers have to be within about a 50 mm -hmm. kilometer radius of each other in order for us to be able to have less than two milliseconds of latency round trip between any two of those buildings. Okay. Mm -hmm. So within a data center building, okay, the maximum latency that we expect is 600 microseconds, not milliseconds. That, you know, 
Uh, between two buildings, the maximum latency that we can support is two milliseconds round trip. In other words, one, one millisecond each way. Um, and the reason why is because we, if you're doing something like an availability zone or zone redundant storage, I need to be able to fail between those buildings seamlessly. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is kind of an important thing to consider, though. When you, you know, when you, when you step into a building, for example, there are no labels on anything. OK, so like when you go into a physical facility, any of these regions, there's no labels. And the reason why there's no labels is because you don't know if your data is in that building or another building. It could mm -hmm. be there one minute. It could be in another building the next minute. And so we're constantly doing that concept of live migration or or, you know, vMotion if you're a VMware person at the building scale. OK, so if we need to redistribute load because of, you know, some uh, power issue or we've got like some you know, we're doing maintenance or whatever, or et cetera, it'll stay in the region. It never leaves that region. Yeah. So when you put your data into a region, it will never leave it. Microsoft does not own your data. Okay. So you own your data and we actually get audited on this through ISO, something called ISO 27,018 that mandates that we don't own your data. Okay. So what that implies though, is, is that when you put your data into a region, you own it. We can't move it out of there. OK, only you can move that data out of a region. Um, so anyways, these regions are important building blocks for us. And when you step into a building, there's a lot of security by obscurity. So I already mentioned this, like nothing is labeled. Uh, mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, uh, and, and the data is encrypted. It, it, most of the time, the data is encrypted two and three times at rest. OK, and what I mean by that is like every disk in the in every data center of Azure is encrypted. OK, there's not a single disk in the cloud that's not encrypted. Um, but usually you'll put your data inside of blob storage and the blob will be encrypted. And then you put a database in the blob and the database will be encrypted. And then you put transparent data encryption on some type of something like SQL and that'll be encrypted. So we can get into scenarios where there are three, four, five mm -hmm. layers of encryption at rest. And if I pull, we also don't do traditional RAID in our data centers and, and RAID, redundant array of inexpensive disks, right? So what that means is that, you know, we do the stripe, we just don't do the parity. And the mm -hmm. reason why we don't do the parity is because we're making three copies of your data at all times. Okay, so that's the lowest minimum viable persistent storage that you can acquire is three copies of data. So, you know, if, if we're, if, if if you think about that from the security perspective, okay, we're making three copies. We're using this dynamic stripe of software uh, to create your data, uh, to, to lay it on a disk, right? And then all the data is encrypted, you know, two, three, four times at rest. It wouldn't matter if somebody pulled a disk. A, they wouldn't no. know what they were pulling. B, if yeah. they pulled it, they'd have to decrypt, they might get a 64th of a file or a 20th of a file mm -hmm. because it's sprayed across multiple disks. And then they'd have to decrypt that that thing four or five times, right? So that, you know, there's a lot of security by obscurity, but there's also a lot of embedded security that people just can't work around. You know, you get to see some other things in the data center too, like we don't have keyboard video monitor ports in the data center. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff like that. You know, there's no keyboards in the data center. There's no monitors in the data center, right? So, um well, actually, also, I, I think this this is actually a reason what Holger mentioned to go to the cloud to get to increase the security because no no uh, customer or even hoster can have such a level of security in their own data center. Right, it's really difficult. Yeah, yeah because you you know when you're in a hosting like a co-location facility, you're usually in a cage. They give you your own cage of servers mm -hmm. and switching and routing and storage, but all of that has to be labeled because it's your stuff. For us, it's like it doesn't have to be labeled and and the people and this is where I was going to go here is like the people who work there don't know what's in the building. Right, mm -hmm. so we have this separation of duties and that's what SOD stands for separation of duties. So the only people who work in the data centers are what we call fa facility operations center people Fox. This is not a swear word. Uh, it's it stands for facility operations center people and uh, all they see in the data center is air conditioning, water, power. That's all they know. They don't know anything about the data. There is no window in the facility that says, you know, customer data here, or mm -hmm. here's how Exchange is performing today, or here's how Azure is performing. They don't see any of that. All of that is managed by the network operations center people. 
And those people are traditionally thousands of miles away from the physical facilities. As a matter of fact, people who work in the Network Operations Center don't have physical access. We don't allow you to mix physical and logical access. Right? I actually think I, I heard sometime that if you were a knock, then you cannot immediately become a fuck. Yeah, yeah, you can't go. That's right. Yeah. So if you have if you have logical access, you cannot you can't you can't have physical access. We don't allow them to mix and match. Exactly. Amazing. Yeah. And and so and that's not un I would say any, uh, you know, any highly mature customer of ours, they they don't allow mm -hmm. administrators in the data centers either. But I'll tell you when I, you know, in my day, I used to teach hosting companies how to build hosting facilities. I saw administrators in the data center all the time. Um, but I would say that. Hopefully more people that are not doing that anymore. Lastly, we have a role called SOC, the Security Operations Center folks. And there's actually a few different types of SOC inside of Microsoft. One is the physical security of the building, uh, which is, you know, um, and there's elements of that too. We actually call that GSOC inside of Microsoft. But like the there's physical building security, okay? And then there's the logical security telemetry coming off of our systems. Um, those are actually separated as well. So even though we say SOC, we mean multiple things there too. And those are those are physically separated each, from each other. You can't have, you know, that the security signal is much more a, f a focus of the network operation center, this, like the signal versus the protecting of the building and all of the telemetry coming off of the building, which is more what we call GSOC data. Mm -hmm. So we don't mix and match those either. Um, so once again, the people who work there, they have no they have no idea what's in the building. All they see is blinky lights and water yeah. and power and air conditioning, if there is any. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Any questions about that, Holger and, and Gorin? No, good, good, good. Good, good. Okay. So let's move down here. I wanted to also talk a little bit um, about what we do in terms of uh, attacking ourselves in production all the time. And so we have a full team of people who are our reds and blues. We also have a we have we have some purple things going on too, and I'll describe the purples. Um, but you know, inside of our reds and their blues, uh, we actively attack ourselves in production all the time. So we have a group of people who act as nation states, um, almost like China or North Korea or any pick any other country that you want. Um, and what they do is they they attack us all the time in production. Um, and so when they find something that you know they don't they don't uh, they don't always work with the blue team. Uh, what they do is they'll you know they'll play war game exercises, but we never stop. And um, when the when the red team discovers something, then what they do is they come together, they exchange their data, and they break back apart. So. The blue team's job is basically to stop them. So if you think of the red team's job as, you know, this, these are the elements of the kill chain, really, these red elements. And the, at the goal of the blue team is to kill, I mean, logically kill them, stop them from doing their jobs, mm -hmm. you know, the red team. But what happens is occasionally they'll get in and they'll do something. And what they'll do is once they, once they kind of hit a roadblock, the red teams, then what they'll do is they'll come together, exchange notes with the blue team, and then they break back apart. There is a there is a game that we uh, we played prior to COVID. I actually haven't heard if we spun this back up yet though because of COVID. It was called One Hunt, and during One Hunt we actually brought our Reds and our Blue teams together for a week of of internal war games. But what we did is we swapped some of the Reds and the Blues, and they would uh, we would active so there was no advantage. So in other words, Blue teams would have Red team tactics and Red teams would have Blue team tactics. And they would act as malicious insiders, not nation states. So if you think of nation states, really, today those are uh, you know people who act, try and attack us from the outside in, uh, although we do worry about embedded actors too, which is a different problem. And I can talk about that. Um, but like, you know, on, on during one hunt, what we actually, you know, when we do this one hunt exercise, what they actually treated them as was like a, as though Holger went malicious or Paul or Goran. Right. So in those scenarios, the red team almost always used to win back in the day. Mm -hmm. It was just a question of how long it took them. Um, uh, but we've been, you know, it's been happening. You know, what was happening right up to COVID is, you know, the window was shortening. Like it used to be at the beginning of one hunt, they, they would break up, they would do this exercise. And at the end, they would come together and the red team would tell them all the blue team, all the stuff that had happened. And they'd be like, oh, we didn't really see all that stuff. 
you know, now we have visibility into what they're doing, but they're usually a few steps behind, maybe. Mm -hmm. And they'll use every tactic in the book. One year, they, uh, this is semi-public, and it's a few years old, so I don't mind sharing it. But one year, they used a zero-day exploit on a wireless access point that was unpatched. And they used that to get into some, uh, so what they did is they redirected all the security people to one path when they went to access the the wireless mm-hmm. access points and they scraped their creds and then for everybody else they sent them in a different in the normal direction and they use those creds to look for fi- you know accounts and then they use those accounts to breach the tenant et cetera et cetera but it all you know they'll use every tactic in the book in terms of in, in including human attacks um, just really quickly here though. You know, some of the things that we we know, we know that nation states are trying to embed actors inside of Microsoft as well. So there are uh, active games that we play mm-hmm. uh, or, or active uh, methods that we put in place, almost like what we call blind collusion events, where people are working, uh, you know, you have to do something in conjunction with somebody else that you're not sure of who that person is to grant another person an access to somebody. And neither of, neither of those two parties know who the other person is. So... You know, um, because we are worried about people colluding to do nation state attacks and playing a long game internally. So we worry about it, you know. I think so we have- this this fact alone is so fascinating. I mean, the, the, the effort it takes to build a red team and a blue team and to run these exercises. If I look at customers, who has the resources to do this? And And I mean, obviously, if a bad actor wants to breach into Microsoft, they also want to breach it into all the other manufacturing companies or everyone to 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 um, steal information and i i don't see these things with with most of our customers and now if they put their their workload on azure they can immediately benefit from all these investments like the red blue team i, I think that I, when i heard about this for the first time i was really amazed what 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 we are doing there yeah most companies would just outsource it to a penetration tester you know, and so yeah. they, they but just take in a one time thing, probably. Right. Yeah. Well, or, or you're periodically. Yeah, for for certain. I think the difference for us is that, you know, we, we have a few different groups of security inside of Microsoft. One is called Mystic. And if you look inside of our security tooling, you will see them referenced in things like threat analytics, which we can talk about some other time. But like Mystic is our, you know, they are our deep scientific security geeks. And, and mm-hmm. so they 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 you know they're they're very much engaged on what nation states are doing like apt 29 happy bear which is russia right or apt you know whatever you know the the persistent threats those apt stands for advanced persistent threats uh, they're actors right and we usually correlate them against nations um so you know the point is is that you know there's the mystic team along with our reds and others you know they just never stop looking yeah no, we don't, and that's that's the difference. It's not a periodic thing; it's a consistent thing. Yep, um, and it's because we're getting attacked 365 days a year, and we kind yep. of have an assumed breach strategy, anyways, throughout our environment. And, and these war games between the red and blue team are continuously being played. Right yeah, now. I mean, uh, yes, yeah, I mean, there are some formal times uh, where they, you know, where they they know what they're doing on certain exercises, but for the most part, yeah, just the red team never stops evaluating. Yeah, never. Yeah, um, you know, on that topic, I wanted to talk a little bit about a company that we acquired last summer called Risk IQ. You know, um, and these guys are doing different things, but this is useful to us. I just kind of want to, you know, I, I think, you know, if you understand, like when we talk about other things in the future webcast, this will be useful data to come back to. Um, Risk IQ is not doing what we do. These guys are doing something else. So uh, the way that I think of malicious uh, attackers is almost like a chef in a kitchen, right? And what they use is ingredients and they put mm-hmm. those ingredients together in recipes and they use that recipe against you, right? The thing about chefs is that they kind of tend to do the same thing over and over. You know, they get really good at making a cake and they're like, I'm going to keep making cakes, you know? So what we what we do is we understand most nation state attackers by the things that they do in their recipes of the attacks. Um, Risk IQ is not focused on the recipes. So when we acquired Risk IQ, what they bring to the table is all of the tactics that malicious entities do before they even launch an attack or a recipe and against you. So think of it like uh, Risk IQ is watching them take the utensils out of the drawer, 
before mm-hmm. they've even started the recipe. So like, w- as opposed to the way that we tend to think of security, it's like, well, when it touches us, then we'll start to deal with it. Mm-hmm. These guys say, no, 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 they haven't even touched you yet. Here's what they're doing to get ready to, to hit you. Okay, so yeah. examples of that would be like, hey, I see that uh, you registered a new domain name and instead of Microsoft, Interesting. Yeah, instead of, you know, when you created this new domain name, you called it Microsoft, but you replaced the I with a one. Yeah. Right. Well, they've seen that before. You know, it's that's kind of a spoofing uh, attack where it's like they're trying to spoof the domain realm name like Microsoft.com with M1 C-R-O-S-O-F-T. Right. Um, Things that users might miss. So, uh, you know, they would risk IQ would see that and they look for that actively. Another example is like, hey, you registered an MX record in your in your DNS so you can start sending email, but there's no DKIM, no DMARC, no SPF record assigned to it. It's like, okay, well, that's that's not normal enterprise hygiene or like they created a a Web page for the realm, you know, this M1 Crowsoft.com. They created a new domain like a, a web page for it, but it says under construction, right? Mm-hmm, okay, well, mm-hmm. they're probably using that web page to do command and control, right? They've seen, they recognize that as an attack, right? So all of these things, these tactics that malicious countries or no malicious attackers use, they kind of look at those. And what we do inside of Microsoft is we correlate that against data that we get in our platform. So from a physical perspective, you know, we start seeing some of these Uh, you know, utensils being pulled out of the drawer, we can actually use that earlier in our cycles to say, oh, we see what they're doing when they try and touch our infrastructure, right? So that risk IQ is being built into uh, some of our security capabilities like Sentinel, but we obviously use that signal as well for other things. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, um, so let's move off of reds and blues. I want to talk a little bit about the physical buildings here too. And just so you get a sense for like, some of the things that we do, you know, we if you if you drove up to one of our buildings, we have these fences that can't be climbed. They're actually they have a weird coating on them, and the way that they're arranged, they're really <laughs> you have to be really you know to kind of do some interesting things to get over them. Um, the other thing is is that we don't have any addresses, like we don't advertise our buildings, and that's normal data center hygiene. Nobody really should, but like. We don't advertise them. We don't actually have signs that say Microsoft here or whatever. Um, we also rescreen our employees, and in different countries, we may do these things differently. So, in the United States, for example, we we rescreen our employees every two years, mm-hmm. and if they show up on a government no fly list or a watch list, or they're you know they they get trade debarred, like they can't do trade, or they're uh, they show up as felons, for example, they get pulled out of our our tools logically immediately, right? In other countries, you know, we have different regulations that we have to abide by. So, you know, the rules in Germany are different than they are in France, than they are in the UK. But we always abide by the country of origin rules. So if we have people working out of those countries, they have to abide by whatever the rules are there. Um, You know, we have metal detectors and and when you walk into our buildings, you know, you, you get screened on the way in and on the way out. So, like, for example, when you go into the data center itself, you know, you have to go through a metal detector. They make you take off your shoes. They scan your shoes. Um, what we're really trying to protect against is bring people bringing media in. And so you see the next line item is no media here. Um, we don't allow thumb drives into the data centers. Mm-hmm. By the way, all the ports are disabled anyways, or they don't exist at all. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but, you know, we don't allow thumb drives into the data center. If, if a vendor needed to bring a thumb drive into the facility, they actually have to send it to our global uh, our security, we screen it, and then we send it to the data center and they pick it up behind a closed, you know, in, in the protected area. If they need to get the thumb drive out, they put it back in a locker. Then what they do is we send that to our security, they, re- they re-screen it again, and then they, they may allow it out. But in general, we don't allow media in or out of the data center full stop. Mm-hmm. Unless, but if we do have processes in place if they have to. And by the way, the next line item here, I tried to fix this right before and Holger and I were, he was watching me try and do it. It should say we used to weigh you, not weight you. Um, but on the building, we used to weigh people in when they came into the building and we weighed them on the way out. And if they weighed more on the way out than they did on the way in, we would scan <laughs> them. Uh, the reason why we don't have to do that anymore is because all that, we were worried about people pulling hard drives out of servers. Mm-hmm. 
And a long time ago, and this is many years, 10 or 12 years ago, we used to have this solution called BPAWS. It stood for Business Productivity Online Services. That was what, what we offered in Exchange and SharePoint before, before we did Office 365. Back then, Exchange was not encrypted at rest. So oh, okay. we worried about people pulling hard drives out. Now we don't have to worry about that stuff. So we don't weigh you anymore. That would be embarrassing anyways, because I'm COVID fat. <laughs> After COVID, yes. <laughs> yeah, COVID fat. Um, you know, there is a complete chain of custody that we manage. In other words, we know everything that was ever done to every single piece of hardware in our data center. Every single hard drive is tracked. Every motherboard is tracked. Every processor, every memory chip. We do not let things are in or out of the building without knowing the exact chain of custody all the way through. And so, for example, when somebody pulls a hard drive, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the SOC people, the Security mm -hmm. Operations Center people work in conjunction with the FOC, the Facility Operation people, and a SOC person will follow a FOC person all the way to wherever the hard drive is being pulled. Maybe it's because it's failed. And by the way, we fail hundreds of hard drives a week in typical facilities because we have millions of hard drives. Mm -hmm. So what happens is, is that they'll go and pull it. When they pull the hard drive, the FOC person opens up the cage and pulls the hard drive. Um, when they pull it, uh, the SOC person, now they scan the disk and then they drop it into a barrel that's locked. They're basically, a, it's a garbage can with a hole cut out and you can't reach in there, but you can drop the hard drive in. And But before we do, we would scan it. And then we, we do it, when, the, when the bin was full enough, we would wheel those bins into the shredding rooms and then they would, uh, they would lock them in a cage and the SOC person had to follow the barrel all the way into the cage. Then they would lock the cage the SOC person would acknowledge that it was locked, and then the FOC person who was doing the hard drive shredding would open up the barrel, and they would scan every hard drive, and then they would shred it. So we would know exactly when hard drives are brought in, when hard drives are brought out. We know when memory is brought in. Flash drives get shredded as well in some cases, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, <laughs> yeah. a lot of work. <laughs> it is a lot of work, yep. Yeah, any questions about that, Holger or Gorn, though? Make sense so far? Uh, no, makes sense. I, I'm just impressed. I mean, yeah, I, okay, cool. still, I'm <laughs> impressed, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, in our facilities coming to the next one, you know, we have we have biometrics to access uh, locations. So there is a, you know, there's a smart card that you have to put uh, to get into the data center, but then also you have to do a palm print or an iris print um, in order to get, or a thumbprint to get into the actual where data is. So, um, you know, there is no just you just don't badge through and because, you know, a badge can be handed to somebody, but we also mm -hmm, support mm -hmm. biometrics for all the people who need physical access. And that is not negotiable. We actually have mm -hmm. to do that for data center operations all the way around the globe. Um, vehicle checkpoints there are car traps in, in many of our data centers. So you get stuck, you know, you know the, and, and you, you only one car can come in at a time and we have to there's a vehicle checkpoint for things and. Um, we don't allow cam cameras into the facility. This is actually, when we give tours, we actually say, do not try and bring a camera in here. I'm going to tell you a quick story on this, and it even says in a funny story. Um, this might seem a little risky, but I'll tell you anyways. Uh, when I was giving a tour one time to a group, you know, I told people, do not bring, uh, you're not allowed to take pictures in the facility. If your phone comes out, you know, we have to look at every picture that you've taken over the course of the last 30 days, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, we go that we go, there were 15 people on the tour, which is the maximum number that we'll allow. And so it was a big group and the Microsoft account person was at the back of the group and uh, we had finished the tour. We went back into the room to pick up all of their stuff. It was uh, it was on it's on the second floor. And then we started to go downstairs to the main area where you would be let out and you have to go through a man trap to get out of the building. And as we were coming down. Um, I, I was standing on the landing because I was with these, you know, 14 of the customers and me, and then the Microsoft account person wasn't coming. I'm like, where is he? And I'm, I, so I started to walk up the stairs. I'm like, people stay here. And I started to walk up and he's starting to come down. I'm like, what were you doing? He goes, oh, I wanted to erase the whiteboard. I'm like, okay, cool. Anyway, so we get down to the main area, right to the man trap and the security people say, stop, freeze. And I'm like, what happened? And they said, uh, somebody took a picture in the facility. I'm like, what? Who? Who? And they said that person right there. And so, um, so the, the the security people brought him into a room, and they made him take out his phone and look at all the pictures that he had taken over the last thirty days. Lo and behold, <laughs> there were a lot of pictures of him and his girlfriend that nobody wanted to see yeah. on his camera. 
including myself. <laughs> and the, the, the guy is the guy is like, please don't tell anybody about this. And I'm like, dude, it's already in the report, you know, and, <laughs> and not um, everyone knows. <laughs> yeah. Well, not, but his customer didn't really know, but the customer knew that he took his camera out and he had to get back on the bus with them to go back to the Microsoft offices. And so he's sitting on the bus with them and knowing that he broke our security and he got in trouble for it. Not only that, at the Christmas party later that year, I had to see his girlfriend there with him. And I'm like, oh, I know way more about you than you think I do. Oh, God. So um, anyway, so I think you, you motivated more than enough people not to take the pictures. I, I think they're done at this point. I use this <laughs> to tell people why you don't bring a camera with you. Anyways, there is, lastly, there is no wireless in our data centers. We don't allow that. There is no wireless access points in the data mm -hmm. center. And there's also, by the way, inside of Microsoft as a whole, we are largely off of the concept of backnet. So what I mean by that, is, first of all, even if you are in our cloud, there is no backnet anyways. There's no ability for you get to get your workstation onto a network. Okay, even uh, there is no wireless access points that are on the same network as Azure, for example. Okay, that mm -hmm, just doesn't mm -hmm. fit. But even in our offices, Microsoft, Microsoft offices, there is where we have, we're almost completely done with getting off of backnet. In other words, there are domain controllers and file servers and still some source code repositories because we have SAP in our back, you know, and some SAP in our backnet today to this day, but there are no workstations on our backnet largely. So when you go into our offices now, your default route is out to the internet. If you need access to backnet resources, that's an exception, not a norm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, there, it's just, you know, these are all things that help us, especially if you think about the administrative uh, things that could happen, you know, uh, all of our workstations are Azure AD joined. In other words, that means that if you look at the properties of them, it says work group. So here, even if I do it, if I go to settings here and I show you like, this is what it looks like. I don't mind showing you this, but if I go to a system down here, right about, and I say domain or work group, you'll see it says work group, right? It's, there is no domain, mm -hmm. right? So, and that means that, and we use something called LAPS, local administrator password service, meaning all of our administrative accounts are randomized across all of our devices. So even if somebody breached my machine, they have no ability to get to a server. They have no ability to get to any mm -hmm. other workstation. It just kind of stops there for the most part. Yeah. yeah okay. Cool. Um, one of the last, you got a few more things to tell you about. You know, we we do, we do not let HP and Dell and others tell us what we want to buy. We design our own hardware, and the reason why is because it, we you know we have millions of servers. Imagine if you know we were replacing. We we run our data centers extremely hot. Okay, and and so in, on average, the the number used to be about four years that we would try and keep hard year, hardware. So to us, the, the calculus that we go through is how hot can we run these servers to burn them out at four years? Mm -hmm. That's kind of the way we think, as opposed to the way our customers would tend to think, which is how can I keep this server forever? We're like, no, no, no. We want it out of our infrastructure after about four or five years, right? So we figure, can we run it hotter so that it fails after about four, right? So imagine if you're failing... Imagine if you're swapping out, uh, if you have a four-year refresh cycle, that means that you, every year you're swapping out 25% of your servers, right? Imagine if you had millions of servers, let's just say a million, just yeah. one, you have way more than a million. That means every year you're swapping out 250,000 servers. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you think of it that way, imagine if we were buying traditional hardware from the likes of Cisco and Dell and HP and others, you know, imagine how many different motherboards we would have lights yeah. out controllers, raid controllers, et cetera. Yeah. So we don't do that. We design our own servers in doing so we strip off all the things that we don't want. And then we mm -hmm. tell HP and Dell and others what to make for us. Okay. So um, now this is not the way it works in SAP. Okay. But in, in, in the rest of Azure, this is the way it works. So what's left is we don't do like things like you'll see things like we don't do logos on our servers because mm -hmm. logos cost about five cents a box. And when you're paying for millions of servers a year, you don't want to pay the five cents. Mm -hmm. So these are all open source servers, no logos. There's no KVM ports on them, new USB ports, no extra blinky lights, right? Because all of that is waste in our data center. There's yeah. no value to a blinky light. There's basically a power light and a failure light and that's it. So, um, you know, what you're left with is some hard drive, some memory and some processor stuff. And, you know, uh, you'll see here on the old version, there was like a standardized plug. It would snap into a backplane. Um, now what we actually do is we move towards a different form factor where we uh, keep the shell of the server forever. In other words, this box we will use 30 mm -hmm. times over. 
but will replace the guts, the center of the box, uh, over and over and over. So in doing so, you know, you'll see some ports come back. These are, like I said, these are open cloud servers. Uh, Dell, like for example, makes them and Dell could sell our customers one, but they do not want to, and they don't advertise these any place on their website because we've stripped off everything that they want to sell them, right? Yeah. We've stripped out the RAID controller. We've stripped out the lights out management board. We took the logo off of the box, so they've got no marketing. We've taken the, you know, the blinky lights off, all the, you know, the vanity stuff that people are like, oh, doesn't my server look pretty? And we're like, we don't need any of that vanity. So, you know, we have the, the, the same shell could hold an AMD processor, an Intel processor, an ARM processor. We have one U enclosure, a U is a unit, one and three quarter inches. So we have one U box, two U boxes, three U, four U. Um, and we basically tell the likes of our hardware vendors what we want to put in them. But it means that all of our hardware is tightly controlled. There is no variance in it. Mm -hmm. What that also means is that I know exactly what the processor does to talk to the motherboard and that to, that uses it to talk to the, the NIC card, to talk to the, the memory. And so we actually embed something in our servers called Project Cerberus, which attests that all the hardware has not been messed with. So okay. if you remember a few years ago, we had this concern over super micro boards and there was like these little teeny tiny things that they were worried that they were shoving into the motherboards to sniff mm -hmm. data. We don't do that. We design our own hardware, right? So we know what all of our hardware looks like. We know what it's supposed to be doing, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. If you want one more, one or two more things here and then we'll, we'll jump out. Uh, you know, your data is yours. We don't, when you put your data into our cloud, we do not own it. We don't touch it. So like I said, you know, everything is encrypted within our facilities. There is no exception. All the data in motion is encrypted. All the data at rest is encrypted. And in certain, especially for Azure, you can bring your own keys to our cloud. So, um, et cetera, that in all the disks are shredded. Like I said, we treat data as though it's yours and it's a liability to us. That's mm -hmm. really the way that we think of your data as it's a liability. So we put barriers in between your our people and your data to make sure that nobody can ever touch your data without it come without an authorization coming from you. Mm -hmm. That's the goal for us is that people we can't mess with your data. Okay, we and it, because you think about it from that perspective, you might be like, oh, Microsoft wants access so they can send, sell me marketing. It's like no, that would be a that would be a lawsuit. Your data is a liability to me. I need yep. to put barriers between me and your data so that I can't nobody in our processes can request it automatically without your approval. Okay. So that's a little bit about your data and our being our problem. The last thing <laughs> I want to talk about here, unless you guys have any questions, Holger. No, no, no. I was, uh, your data, our problem. I like yeah, that. Yeah, like pretty much, <laughs> that's it. So the last thing I want to mention here is, is it, you know, I, I mentioned that we don't have any backnet in our environment, but what we do use is we use these concept of secure administrative workstations. Um, we have two different names for these, by the way. We call them SAWS when we're talking about Microsoft. When we help you deploy them for yourselves, we call them PAWS, Protective Administrative Workstations or Privileged Access Workstations, depending on which acronym you're using, um, but it's the same. But what that SAW means for us internally is that it's basically when we do administrative work, the only way to do that is through a SAW. And that secure workstation is locked down with use something using attack surface reduction rules. In other words, it can't communicate on the internet. It can't load source code. It can't run anything. It can't, all it can do is basically open up a command line window and that's it. Mm -hmm. Because all of Azure is managed by command line. There is no console access. If you do console, that is a different process. We have to get an exception for that. It's recorded and there's a different, whole different workflow. I would, uh, of that, I, I, I don't have an exact percentage. I'll just say 90 something percent, and it's probably closer to 99.9 .9 of everything is done by the command line in Azure because we just can't scale things to do it onesie, twosie. Yeah. And we've got millions yeah. of things. Imagine if we we're doing this with a console, how many times we'd have to hit control, alt, delete. Okay. So everything is done by a command line. And what that it means is that. We have a, you know, the auditing of what occurred is not, you know, oh, I'm going to watch a bunch of mouse clicks here. What I'm going to watch is the code so I know how to roll things forward. I know how to roll things back, mm -hmm. right? Because it's all done through command line. And these, there is no internet access for these saws. The, the saws' sole job is to manage our cloud, yeah. not to do web, e not to do email. 
We do not mix those things. These are dedicated devices, by the way. Mm -hmm. Not for, uh, we do have a concept of a virtual saw, a, a virtual saw, but you know, uh, that's an exception also. Most of the time it's a physical device that people carry around. Um, and those obviously have multi-factor authentication bound to them as well and physical tokens and things like that. So it'd be very difficult to do administrative work because we have things like IPSEC policies and jump servers at different tiers of our cloud and things like that they have to go through. But the only thing that can access any of that stuff is a SAW, which is a highly managed device. Yep. Make sense? Well, Simulating. Well, I <laughs> cool. think I'll move my house to the Azure Data Center, you know. <laughs> Last thing here is you just the kind of the, the global intensity of our network and we'll, you know, just millions and millions of miles of fiber optic cable and hundreds of data centers and things like that. The one last thing I want to call out is when you get onto our network, right? When you hit the Microsoft, when you hit Azure, you never leave it. Okay, so unlike other cloud providers, and I'm not picking on anybody else, but you can ask them. Once you touch our backbone, you stay on our backbone. So if you, for example, if you did a trace route inside of Microsoft, like if you were if you were trying to access something, uh, let's just say an SAP instance or like, you know, some other thing in Azure, right? Mm -hmm. Or Office 365. <clears throat> you might see like, you know, your network provider like in, here in the US, like AT&T level three or whatever, uh, uh, you know, like K, you know, KPN in the Netherlands. I don't, I don't know if one-on-one -one hosting or Einstein's and is still around, but like whoever your network provider is, right? So you, you would hit the edge of Azure eventually. And once you hit it in a trace route, all you would see is, Microsoft, 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 and then as the data is coming back, it would be Microsoft, Microsoft. We do not use the internet to backhaul data. Mm -hmm. Once you hit our fiber optic cable, it is fully owned or leased fiber optics. There is no shared fiber. There is no multiplex fiber. It is all Microsoft fiber on our backbone. So between any of these hundred, you know, we have about 64 regions today. If you're going between regions, you're going over a Microsoft dedicated fiber link. Mm -hmm. So we never stop laying fiber around the globe. Um, it stays private, which is security okay. and performance as well. Yeah, yeah, it's both a yeah. That that's that's exactly right. It's both a performance thing and a security thing. And there is a published uh, article up on the uh, on the internet where you can see the latency between any two data centers and, yeah. and you can yeah. kind of look at them to figure out exactly what it would result in terms of latency. But uh, yeah, so that's it. That's what I wanted to tell you guys. I mean, like I know that's that's a lot. Um, Hopefully you found that was kind of useful, but you know, I'm I, I want to hear if you have any questions. I'm blown away. <laughs> I really? mean I didn't yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean uh, I knew it, but never never when I actually Holger, you were going in that data center um tour. So probably those kind of stuff will be told more and more in detail. But uh, I have to say I'm really impressed, you know. I oh, didn't that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Gordon, I, and, and for everybody watching this podcast, what I would say is you have to remember that these physical data centers and virtual data centers are things that our enterprise customers have access to as well. Yeah. So if you ever, you know, if you're one of our large enterprise customers and you want to do a virtual data center tour, you can go through your account team and they can request them and we will happily deliver them to you. And, you know, in those tours, it goes way beyond what I showed you. Yeah. We're showing you things like, you know, how how this was all focused on security. When we do the virtual data center tours, we tell you about all whole kinds of other things too. So, um, but, you know, and hopefully, you know, once now that, you know, COVID is settling down, you know, we'll get back to physical tours as well. And so for the largest of our customers, you know, we would be happy to bring them in. Um, yeah, and I, by the way, if you're a small customer, it's hard to get in <laughs> because they're booked. It's they're booked months in advance, uh, and and enter, large enterprise customers always take priority. So I, I apologize, but that's just the way it is. They, they're these aren't like Disney World. They're meant for yeah. you know mm -hmm. things that are going on. So, anyways, um, virtual is something we can deliver to almost anybody, uh, yeah. as long as you're a managed account. Yep, requires an NDA. So. Um, Good stuff. Oh, fantastic. That, that was really, really great. And um, as, as Goran said, even though I, I knew a few things and I, I, I visited a few regions already before, um, it's always absolutely fascinating to to hear this. And, it, and you 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 did a fantastic presentation, so I really, really enjoyed every bit of this. And, and now actually, I'm even more exciting to hear the next step. As you said, we, we, we built with this house, we have this house, and now we have the foundation. So I'm actually, I hope that you agree to, to join again. Um, our podcast and and 
um, go to the to the next level of our house, and then um, right. we'll leave the physical stuff behind and see what other things we have in place. I'll share a secret with you, Holger. If you don't ask me to do these types of things, I don't have a job. So I'm happy <laughs> when you ask me to do them. I will ask you. <laughs> <laughs> And this is my job to talk to people about what we do. And if nobody asks me for anything, I don't have anything to do. It's hard to justify the, the money they pay me. So no I'm problem. looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Again, it was really, really fascinating. Thanks for, for all the time and all your insight that you that you shared. So um, as I said, I, I really hope that we'll have you soon on the podcast again. And I'm I'm really looking forward to that. Me too. Okay. Thank you, everyone. See you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank